Well, welcome, folks. I guess welcome's not the appropriate word. You're welcoming us into your home, but uh, welcome indeed. I hope that you had a good Christmas. We're shooting this video before um, Christmas, so we're still anticipating it here. Um, but I think these words from the Christmas carol, God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, is uh, appropriate to, to think about as we begin our time together. Uh, the song goes like this. Fear not then, said the angel, let nothing you affright. This day is born a savior of a pure virgin bright to free all those who trust in him from Satan's power and might. That's the news of Christmas. Christ has come, the great king, and he's come to free us from our sins and the tyranny of Satan. And I pray that that news is making your heart glad this Christmas season. So what we're going to do in this video is pretty simple. We're going to sing a few songs together. And then I'm going to bring the word to you, and my prayer is that this video will be a source of encouragement for you in the midst of our 14-day lockdown. So I'm just going to give it over to the worship team, and they're going to lead you in a, a few songs. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning via uh, video, and um, just that... Hope that this is an encouragement to you as you worship this morning with your families or um, on your own. Um, Feel free to sing along with us. You have called us out of darkest night into your glory.
face to his long foretold. Oh, in the shadows of Bethlehem, promise of dawn now.
adored the King who came to our world to save us, to heal our prideful race, crown us with forgiveness, fall or oh, fall before the one who in mercy left his throne. Bless the Lord, God's only Son, His glory. start reading here right off the bat. If you're still looking for your Bible, just hit the, hit the pause button, and when you find your Bible in your place, you can pick the video back up. So Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22. Let's give ourselves to God's Word. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was eighty-four. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Let's pray together as we consider uh, this text from the Gospel of Luke. Father, we are amazed at your mercy this Christmas season, this time of Advent as we remember, as we consider the birth of your beloved Son. Oh, Father, we are made glad as we think upon your grace revealed in the gospel. What mercy, what love you've shed upon us, rescuing us from our sin, 
transferring us into the kingdom of the beloved, uniting us to your son and pouring out into our hearts your spirit of love. And so we worship you. And Father, as we think about your word this morning and as we hear it taught, we do ask, we do ask that you would do a spiritual work within us, that you would turn our hearts to Jesus and that we would seek him as our greatest good, just like Simeon did, just like Anna did. Would you do this in our hearts now? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Waiting. This is a word that none of us really like to hear. How many of us like to wait? I definitely don't. If I'm at the grocery store or at Canadian Tire or Home Depot, I see the lines and I make a plan about what line I think is moving the quickest because I don't want to wait. Or we see traffic and we make plans to to navigate around that traffic because we don't want to get hung up there. We don't like to wait. And as we think about it, we are a people embedded in a culture, in a society of instant gratification. And we don't have to look very far to confirm this fact. We're a society that has fast food chains. When we're hungry, we want to eat right away. And so there's a whole industry built upon that, that desire for instant gratification. We're a society of TV. We want to be entertained, and when we want to be entertained, we want to be entertained right away. Hit the remote, entertainment right away. Even more, we're a society built on on debt. If you want to buy something, you don't need to wait and save. Instead, buy it now and pay for it later. There's no need to wait when you can have everything you want right now. Instant gratification. It's built into our society And we're swimming in these waters. But when we turn to the scriptures, and when we take a close look at the Christmas story, especially the text we just read, we realize that God doesn't operate the way we do. He's not the God of instant gratification. He's operating with a different set of values. And so Luke chapter 2, verses 28, 22 through 38, is a story of waiting. And as we consider this story together, I want to ask two questions of this story of waiting. And they're both very simple questions. The first question is this. What does the story of waiting reveal about the people of God? So we're trying to to figure out what, what should the people of God look like and how should they act in this present age? What should characterize the people of God? So what does this story about waiting teach us about the people of God? And second, what does this story of waiting teach us about God himself, our God? What are we going to learn about God from these verses? So let's consider the first question. What does this text teach us about the people of God? So the event found in our text takes place shortly after the birth of Jesus. Mary, Joseph, and Jesus come to the temple to offer a sacrifice in accordance with the law of Moses. So Leviticus chapter 12 tells us the laws of purification after childbirth, and they they come to present Jesus in the temple. And so after 40 days of purification, the couple comes to the temple to do this. And as we read the text, as we work through the beginning portion of this story, nothing really stands out in these verses. Joseph and Mary are following the law of the Lord and the customs of the people of Israel. However, as we continue to move on in the text, the ordinary doesn't last long. Mary and Joseph, as they enter into the temple, meet two individuals who are waiting to see their infant son. So let's look at the text together. Verse 25 tells us about this first individual. The text says this, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So Luke is selective in what he tells us about Simeon. He's only giving us the pertinent information. We do not know if Simeon was rich or poor, We don't know for certainty his occupation. We have some guesses. We don't know if he was married or single. However, we do know a few things about Simeon. He was righteous and devout. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And most importantly, as we see in our text, he was doing something. Did you catch that? What was Simeon doing? He was waiting. The text says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And as we consider Simeon, We have to recognize that Simeon was not waiting for a couple of hours. He was not waiting for a couple of days or a couple of months. He was waiting years. 
In fact, he was prepared to wait a while. Look at verse 26 again. The Lord told him through the Spirit that he would see the Christ before his death. So Simeon was prepared to wait for the Lord's Christ for the long haul. He was waiting for the long haul. Luke also tells us about another individual in this passage. And this time, it's a woman, and her name is Anna. And this woman is a prophetess and a longtime widow. And and like Simeon, she was devout. And the text tells us that she did not leave the temple and that she spent her time worshiping, fasting, and praying. And most importantly, just like Simeon, she was doing one thing. And, And Luke draws us into this. She was waiting She, along with other faithful Jews, were awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem. So just like Simeon, it would be safe to say that Anna was not waiting for a few hours or a few days or a few weeks. She was waiting years. Her whole lifetime was a lifetime of waiting. We see in our text that she set herself aside shortly after the death of her husband to wait and long and pray and fast for the coming redemption that God would bring to his people. And so here we have, we're looking at this story. Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to the temple. They meet these two characters, Simeon and Anna. And we need to pause here and ask. We need to talk to the writer of this story, Luke, and we need to ask him, why would you include these stories for us? What's the, what's the significance of Anna? What's the significance of Simeon for us? Well, I don't think this question is all that hard to answer. It's right in front of us. Luke has given us these two characters and their responses and their activities as a portrait, as a portrait of what the true people of God look like and act like. And so what is this text teaching us about what the people of God look like and act like? Well, we can say this. Those who truly love God, those who truly love God, wait for him to act upon his word. That's how we can define the the people of God in this present age. Those who truly love God, wait for him to act upon his word. And as we think about Anna and Simeon and this definition that I offered you, we have to understand that these two characters are not outliers in God's redemptive plan. When you read the scriptures, whether you go in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you find the people of God doing what Simeon and Anna do. And just for example, we can go to one book in the Bible and we find that this is true of the people of God. So if you go to the book of Psalms, what do you find the people of God doing throughout the, this song book? Well, you find them singing songs about waiting on the Lord. Here are a few examples. Psalm chapter 13, verses 1 through 2, Israel sings, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Psalm 35, verse 17, Israel sings again, How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. Psalm 79, verse 5, Israel sings again, How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Psalm 90, verse 13, Return, O Lord, how long? Have have pity on your servants. Psalm 119, verses 81 through 84, My soul longs for your salvation. I I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I've become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I've not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? So we go to the book of Psalms, and what are the people of God doing? Well, they're waiting for the Lord. And it's in their songs, it's in their DNA. And so we can pause here and we can begin to apply all of this to our hearts. Those who truly love God wait for him to act upon his word. This truth does not simply apply to Simeon or Anna or the people of God in the Old Testament. It applies to all of God's people throughout the ages. It applies to you and me. And this is where we need to apply some conviction to our own hearts. This is where we need to bring this to bear upon us. And so I ask you, brother, sister, brother, sister in the Lord Jesus, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? And we can try to work this out in our minds. What is it that you dream about? So, for example, when you sit down with your spouse at night 
And for my family, when the, when the kids are in bed and it's quiet and you're on the couch with your spouse and you just have an hour just to chat quietly with your spouse, what is, what's on the topic of your conversation? Where does your conversation usually head? What, is, what are those topics? What's that gravitational force in your conversation that, that pulls you into orbit and you just can't leave? What do, you, what do you dream about? What are you waiting for? What are you longing for? And as we look at the story revealed in Luke chapter 2, we find that Simeon and Anna were longing for Jesus. And this text is teaching us if we're truly God's people, we must be a people who wait for, dream for, Jesus. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the last page in your Bible. We can think about how the Bible ends. So the second to last verse in the Bible is Revelation chapter 22 verse 20. And the Lord Jesus in this text comes to his church and he says these words. He says to the church, surely I am coming soon. What's Jesus doing here in the second to last verse of the Bible? Surely I'm coming soon. Well, Jesus is telling the church that the church has something to wait for, that the church has something to dream about, that the church has something to to talk about with great anticipation, something to, to long for. He says, surely I am coming soon. He's saying, what you need to dream about is my second coming, my second advent, when I will come and I will end the sinful ordering of this world once and for all, and I will usher in the glorious kingdom of God, and God will dwell with man forever. So Jesus says to the church, surely I'm coming soon. And what does the church say to Jesus? We should know these words. The church says, amen, amen, let it be. Come, Lord Jesus. What do the true people of God do? We see it in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. The, the true people of God, the church, when they're hearing the news of Jesus, the words of Jesus, respond to him and say, Amen, come Lord Jesus. We are going to set our vision upon your coming. We're going to dream about it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to anticipate it. And so brother and sister, I urge you this Advent season to give careful consideration to your dreams and to your aspirations and your desires. Are you waiting for Jesus are you waiting for Jesus, or, are you, or have you set your heart on something else or someone else? And I urge you to, go, to do business with the Lord this, this Christmas season, to, to go to him and ask and pray, well, Lord, would you reveal my heart and what I'm actually dreaming about and what I actually desire? And as you deal with the Lord, ask him to change your heart as you deal with the Lord in earnestness and frankness, that your heart might be set upon Jesus saying with the church in the book of Revelation, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So that's our first question. We've asked, what do God's people look like? What do they act like? Well, they look like a people who wait, who wait for Jesus. We can turn now to our second question. And so we're asking in the second question, from this story of waiting, what do we learn about our God? What do we learn about our God? Let's go back into the story. If you have your Bibles, look at verses 27 through 32. Luke tells us this. And Simeon came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. If you have your Bibles now, stick to the Bible. Look at verses 36 and 38. Listen to these. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. What's going on here? Well, the gospel writer Luke is is beating us over the head with repetition in these two stories. Simeon waited for, for weeks, for months, and for years. And what was the result of all of his waiting? Waiting on the Lord. Well, he got what he was waiting for. Here is Simeon holding in his arms Jesus, and he is worshiping, saying, My eyes, O God, have seen your salvation. And right next to Simeon is this this other story, backing it up, the story of Anna. And Anna waited for weeks and months and years. And what was the result of all of that waiting, that waiting upon God? 
Well, she got what she was waiting for. At the sight of the infant Jesus, her heart was made glad and she began to spread the news that redemption was coming to the people of God, that Jerusalem would finally be redeemed, that Christ has come. Simeon waited for Jesus, he got Jesus. Anna waited for Jesus, she got Jesus. And as we're looking at our text, as we read these stories about Anna and Simeon, it's easy to get lost in their personal stories. They're great stories. Here's this man, here's this woman who, who waited for the entirety of their lives, straining towards one goal, looking ahead with, with one topic on their minds. And here they are in this text, straining, and they finally get what they were waiting for. They get their heart's desire. And, and as we read this text, we want to pry into their emotions and examine their joy and their relief and their feelings of satisfaction. We want to do some psychology and, and get in them because this is so interesting and it's so glorious. And that might be fruitful at another time, but as we look at this text together right now, as I lead you through it, I want to turn your attention away from Simeon, away from Anna, and I want to direct your attention to God. And so we have to ask our question, what does this story, the story of Anna and Simeon, reveal about God? Well, there's two things we learn about God that I want to point out to you. The first is this. From these stories, we learn that God is faithful. When we look narrowly at our text, we find that God was faithful to both to Simeon and to Anna. The the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that he would see the Christ with his own eyes before death. Anna worshipped, prayed, and fasted with her hope set upon redemption. And what does God do in response to these two individuals? He comes through on his word. He, he keeps it. They both waited. And the both Lord met them. The Lord met them and gave them what they were looking for. But we also have to broaden out our gaze because this text is not just about Simeon. It's not just about Anna and their own personal salvation and their own personal experience with the Lord. This text has a broader vision and scope. Listen again to what Simeon and Anna were waiting for. Verse 26, Simeon was waiting for who? The Lord's Christ, the Messiah, the long-promised Messiah. That's just not individualistic. That's, that's national. That's cosmic. What was Anna waiting for? Verse 38, the redemption of Jerusalem. And Luke is preaching to us here, and he is saying something like this if we have ears to hear. He's saying, reader, do you get it? God is faithful. Look at Simeon. Look at Anna. God came through for them. Don't stop there, reader. Go back and consider all the promises of God spanning from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to all of the prophets. Look back and consider all of these. In the birth and the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, not one of these promises have fallen flat or have been forgotten or have been voided. Dear reader, look and consider. Jesus is the Lord's Christ. He's the redemption of Jerusalem. Don't you see it? God is faithful to Simeon, to Anna, to all of his promises made throughout redemptive history from the very beginning of the Bible to the present. God is faithful. Faithful, and that's what Luke is preaching to us. He's saying, reader, don't you see it? God is faithful. That's what you need to set your heart on, God's faithfulness. And there's a second matter that we learn about God. We learn in this story that God is generous, so generous. We see as we study our Bibles that when God goes to do something, he usually does it in an extraordinary fashion. We go back to the the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. God created the world and he did it in an extraordinary fashion. He created the world good, very good, the book of Genesis says. Full of good things. God is generous. And the same thing appears in the Christmas story. With the world in sin, with his people enslaved to Satan, God doesn't go and meet his people's needs halfway or three quarters of the way. No, when he goes to meet his people's needs in redemption, he opens up the storehouses of heaven. He breaks open the the bank vault and he pours out upon his people the most lavish gift that he has. He pours out upon his people his beloved son. God is so exceedingly generous. And the Christmas story reveals the generosity of God. He pours out his 
riches upon us. And have we not tasted them in Jesus? We've tasted forgiveness of sins in Jesus. We've tasted reconciliation in Jesus. We've tasted life in the Spirit in Jesus. We've tasted access to the throne of grace in Jesus. We've received clean consciences in Jesus. We are experiencing these these great riches even to this very day. This is all evidence of God's great generosity. He goes all out in the Christmas story. Don't you see it? The giving of his beloved son. So I want to try to tie all of this together for us and make a closing appeal. Brothers and sisters, waiting upon God is is difficult work. And that's what I've I've called you to do in in the first question. True people of God wait upon God to act according to his word. Or or we we saw in the book of Revelation, the true people of God wait for Jesus. And we realize that this is difficult work. Setting our sights upon Jesus day by day and waiting for his second coming is not easy. We get discouraged. And there are so many reasons for us to be discouraged. Our circumstances, our hearts, We get distracted. There's so many different things to pursue in this present life. So how are we to wait on Jesus? How are we to wait on God's word? How are we to grow in obedience to this call? Well, this is where we have to connect the first question to the second question. We grow in obedience, how? By sinking our teeth into the character of God revealed in the Christmas story. What I just pointed you to, God's faithfulness and God's generosity. We don't persevere, we don't grow in obedience by reaching into our inner reservoirs of personal strength. No, we turn to God as he's revealed himself in the Christmas story, and we go to God and we feast on his faithfulness. We preach to our souls. God has come through on every single promise. You can go and and trace it out through the scriptures. God has come through on every single promise in Christ Jesus. And you preach to your soul, God will come through on his word to me. I will wait because God is faithful. That's how it works. We need to feed on God's faithfulness. And then we're going to be more and more inclined to wait for Jesus. Because we know that Jesus will come. And he will fix all things. Brothers and sisters, we don't keep our focus on Christ, setting him before us by turning into a hermit or a recluse. No, we we turn to God. We grow in obedience by turning to God as as he's revealed himself in the Christmas story. We we turn to God and we feast upon what? His generosity. Again, we, we ought to preach to our souls. If we want to grow in obedience, we have to preach things like this. God has lavishly met all the needs of his people throughout redemptive history. And I know and I am convinced that he will pour out his grace upon my head. I know, I know from the story of Simeon, I know from the story of Anna, that those who wait for Jesus, that those who wait for Jesus get Jesus. And we have to wrestle with our souls, with God's generosity. Reminding ourselves of how generous this God is, how kind he is to us. And then we will wait and we will grow in obedience to this call. And so brothers and sisters, my prayer is that you find great encouragement for your souls in this Christmas story. That you would feast upon God as he's revealed in the Christmas story. That you would find his faithfulness and his generosity precious good news to your soul. And that his faithfulness and generosity would lead you to wait for his son. And that you would walk in obedience just as Simeon and Anna did as they waited for the consolation of Israel. For we still wait for the coming king. Let's pray together and ask God to bless this word to us. Oh, Father, we are amazed at your faithfulness and your generosity. And we want to grow in obedience. We want to grow in obedience. We want to be a people who wait for Jesus. Just like we hear in the book of Revelation, we want to be a people that say, Amen, come Lord Jesus, and that would mark the entirety of our lives. And so, Father, we pray, would you reveal to us again and again your faithfulness, your generosity. Oh, Father, we love you. We ask that you would be at work in us now through this word. We pray this in Jesus' name.